Alrighty. Um, the Odyssey of the Dragon Lords. I am running this campaign right now and enjoying every minute of it. It's a fantastic campaign. Um, incredibly well written. And I am running it online, which, you know, is pretty convenient because everybody's running games online right now. Uh, so, there is a Roll20 module for this, and I have made a video about uh, that module and how I feel about it. Um, one, of the, one of the areas of the game that I think causes a lot of confusion for DMs uh, is Xander's Tomb. Uh, so Xander, he's the OG um, Dragon Lord of the, you know, Dragon Lords, their Odyssey or whatever. Um, and he was buried in a tomb, and the tomb is set up like a labyrinth. And because this is a Greek adventure, and there's a labyrinth, there's a Minotaur. And story-wise, they kind of explain away, like, why this is happening. Um enough that you could just be like cool because i'm not going to play an ancient greece adventure without a minotaur in a labyrinth so this is your um token minotaur in a labyrinth adventure now at first glance seems like a pretty cool map um my feelings on the maps for this uh adventure are the maps are just good enough like they're not great um but they're certainly better than the majority of the maps you're going to get from a Wizards of the Coast product. Uh, one of the things that just drives me nuts about maps that are included with adventures is look at this area right here. There's uh there's a trap here. And the trap is like drawn on the map. Uh Tomb of Annihilation did this all the time. And it's like, why would you do this? You know? Like, why would you show the trap on the map? Describe the trap in the description of the map but don't don't put the don't put it on the map what the hell am i supposed to do with this when my players walk into this room and they see that there's spikes and there's blood on the floor they're gonna know that this is a trap room and if i am not very good at photoshop and i try to cover it up they're gonna be like why is this room so different and if i'm really not good at photoshop and i just lay another map tile on top of this map they're gonna be like what the hell's going on here so yeah um i don't even know uh so yeah there's so much going on with this map that needs fixing uh i'm gonna try my best in an hour to cover as much as i can about fixing this uh mess uh both the roll 20 version uh that you paid 50 flipping dollars for um and the uh, the actual published adventure, which has a lot of things in it that just don't make a lot of sense. So it's a lot to try to do in an hour. So let's just jump into this thing right away. All right. So in another window, I do have the adventure opened. Uh, so I'm going to kind of reference that as we go. We're going to, I guess, start at the beginning and work our way in. Uh, that might be the easiest way to do this. So location 16, Xander's Tomb. Uh, blah 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 there's undead skeletons in here blah 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 there's this guy named Graxus the Butcher um, first and foremost Graxus the Butcher looks like a really bad furry like he's I just don't like the the sort of bull minotaur uh, aesthetic that they went for with uh, Thylea so right away it's just going to be a real minotaur we're just going to have a bull face it's going to be a cow uh, it's, we're not going to go with this weird, like, tiefling that hit the gym too much thing that they've got going on. Uh, so let's dig in. The tomb entrance, uh, white marble carved to the side of a mountain, uh, blah, 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 says Xander on it, blah, blah, blah. Uh, four lesser tombs are adjacent to Xander's. Uh, they aren't even featured on the map. So if your players go in there, I guess theater to the mind that thing. You don't need a map for it. Uh, let's keep going then. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah, there's also these lions on the map, but I don't recall there being any description of the lions or the lion's significance, so I'm not really sure why they bothered to draw lions on the map, other than they thought they might be cool. So, yeah, I don't know, just 
they're good. You might have some players that get obsessed with the lion statues and think they're guardians and try to mess with them. I, I don't know. <sighs> Let's keep going. Uh, location 17. Here we go. We're finally in the tomb. Uh, the expansive hall is dark and wet. Uh, I guess it's wet because this area is really cold, even though none of the maps have snow on them. So condensation or something. Uh, let's see. There's empty torch brackets in the walls at regular intervals. The floor descends in wide steps. Uh, guarding the stairwell is a bronze statue of a kneeling, bull-headed minotaur. Okay, well, we do have that on the map at least. Keep in mind, these are five-foot squares too. This map is five-foot squares. So they're already going to have to squeeze just to get past the statue um, to get into the dungeon. And let's see, uh, there's mosaics that talk about the history of the Dragon Lords being foreign conquerors and all that jazz. All right, then we go to 18, we finally enter the dungeon proper. So, here's things that were done right about this labyrinth. This labyrinth has some beefy ass walls, right? It's got some five foot thick walls. That's really nice. Is it thick enough to prevent a character with the move Earth Cantrip from literally just walking through this entire maze? No, it's not. Uh, that's right. Uh, the move Earth Cantrip can completely destroy this entire complex because it, it is a Minecraft spell. So it takes a five foot by five foot chunk of stone and it moves it. And the dungeon's made of stone. So the, somebody could just walk in with that cantrip and literally just go anywhere they want. I hope none of my players are watching this video because you're going to ruin dungeons for yourselves if you ever realize that a first level, or sorry, a cantrip spell can destroy dungeons. So maybe don't do that. But hey, here's why the five foot wall is thick. If you have a group that has some human decency and doesn't use move earth to destroy dungeons, ain't nobody going to smash through these walls, right? The, these are thick. So that's nice. Um, you might have a warlock, and the warlock might have the I see through walls power. That's kind of hype. Uh, you might have people that are addicted to detect magic. Well, five feet of stone is going to shut that down. So the five foot walls are kind of cool. So we at least have that working for us. So they walk into the dungeon, and they're immediately in a labyrinth. Now, obviously, when you're in a labyrinth, you always go left. You use chalk to mark your way, blah, 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 standard uh, procedures. So they start moving their way through the dungeon by uh, going left because they know what they're doing. And they immediately end up at Graxus's bedroom, location 21. So let's jump over to Graxus's room. Uh, this room stinks of blood and offal. Awful? I don't know. Animal carcasses and slabs of meat hang in the ceiling, blah, blah, blah. So right away, they've got like human farmers. But this place is kind of out of the way. And they did fight a bunch of sirens, like, not sirens, sorry, harpies on the way in. So to me, it makes a lot more sense if there were, like, mountain goats and, like, harpies and stuff in here. Like, something, I don't know, indigenous to the area. I understand they want you to hate this guy and think he's bad, so they went with the classic, like, human farmer. But, like, how far is this cursed minotaur really willing to travel for shopping? You know what I'm saying? Like, mm, probably not that far. So I would just say that it's full of indigenous stuff and just leave it at that trust me they're gonna want to kill this guy anyways you don't they don't need a lot more motivation than that uh let's see what else is going on he's got some treasure here but i guess he's not here right now so that's fine so they keep going left because that's what you do when you're in a labyrinth and they hug the walls and they follow it and they make it to 20 which is the false tomb now this one I really kind of liked because in here you've got a rug of smothering again and you've got a mimic again because uh, I guess you know why not now what is the mimic eating I don't know how do these two mimics stay alive beats me does Graxus feed them his leftover harpies is it like are they like his pets beats me uh, you know how they're sustained magic it's such as the dragons uh if anybody asks you how they're sustained um damon the lich he used magic and now they live forever the end uh that's the joy of magic you don't have to know how anything works you just say magic that's why religion's been so popular for so long because you just get to make up the answers and everyone has to believe you so uh here's the problem uh we've got a miniature labeled mimic and we got a miniature labeled Rugga Smothering. Well, that kind of sucks. 
so if you are using the uh, the purchase module, you're going to want to go in and you're going to want to delete these guys. And then you're going to want to drag over ones that actually have uh, the correct stuff. So um, you would go to your journal tab. I'm not actually using the um, official purchase module. I use my transmog tool to steal the maps and stuff that I, I wanted. Um, so I didn't have to deal with all the nonsense of the purchased version. So plus I had already built like a bunch of stuff myself and didn't feel like transmogging my stuff over to their stuff and vice versa. So, but to give you an idea, I would go to say this harpy, right? And then I would right click and then delete. And then I would go to the um, compendium. I would search for it and I would drag it over. So in this case, uh, let's see, did it bring over a, a mimic that was not registered properly? Uh, yeah, it did. Okay. So there's a, there's a mimic. Um, so I would right click, delete it, and then I would drag a new mimic over. Um, so you go over here, you type in mimic, and then you drag over a new mimic that has art to replace the bad mimic that doesn't have art. Call it a day. Same deal. You would go over to rug of smothering and you would drag this over and then you would delete this one and that solves your problem. Now that's if you're just doing this, you know, to, to do the bare minimum. Now, if you're going full extra, uh, you would go and find an actual like sarcophagus mini, and then you would drag uh, like a sarcophagus mimic, excuse me, which is a real thing uh, from Pathfinder. So, uh, and I have it, gasp surprise. Yeah, so it looks like this hideous creature right here. Look at that, that nasty. Um, yeah, so. I'd bring that in instead. I'd make it a large creature too, instead of medium, because that'd be scarier. Uh, and then for the rug, I mean, I don't know how much cooler you could get than this guy from Aladdin, so I guess we'll just leave that one alone. Um, all right, so I guess we fixed that room. Uh, we're gonna squeeze back into this uh, narrow hallway and keep going left. And now we're in the skeleton room, location 22. Skeleton room location number 22 says, uh, the Chamber of Supplicants. This barrel vaulted chamber. Not exactly sure what a barrel vaulted chamber means. I think it has to do with some kind of architecture where it's got like these uh, half columns built into the walls. Um, but somebody might ask you what that means. So get your Google ready, I guess. Uh, pillars and alcoves along the wall house marble statues of priests and supplicants. Uh, after two rounds of being in this room, uh, which the rounds are there in case combat spilled over into this room. Obviously, if they're not in combat, two rounds is 12 seconds. So 12 seconds goes by pretty quick. Um, the bones and weapons that litter the floor begin to rattle and lock together, sockets clicking into joints. Within moments, uh, six armored skeletons stand before you, slamming their swords against their shields. Hoo-ha. Very much like a scene from The Mummy. I'm down for it. It's cool. Here's the thing about the skeletons. Uh, the skeletons are described earlier uh, in location 18 as the maze is patrolled by two kinds of enemies, minotaur skeletons and skeletons. Uh, the skeletons all wear breastplates because they love handing out breastplates in this adventure uh, and use shields, which give them an AC of 18. They patrol in groups of three and they are trained in hoplite soldier tactics. Oh, wow. That sounds like a pretty cool skeleton. <clears throat> Let's check out Red Circle with the word Skeleton written in yellow and see all the cool custom stuff that it's got that matches up with the adventure. So I'm going to select the mini. I'm going to double click on it. Hmm. It's not even opening a character sheet. Oh, it's not actually linked to a character sheet. Hmm, that's unfortunate. All right. Uh, let's see. It's got 13 hit points and the blue circle is supposed to be 13 armor class. So yeah. I guess uh, these guys don't have special stats. All right. So what are we going to do about that? Uh, let's see. You're going to go to your compendium. You're going to type in skeleton. And we're going to go to standard skeleton. I don't see skeletal hoplite anywhere. That's unfortunate. So let's just go ahead and drag over a regular skeleton. All right. 
And this skeleton in no way resembles a hoplite. It's got a short sword. It's got a short bow. It's only got 13 armor class. It's equipped with armored scraps. So right away, we have to build an entire monster uh, if we plan to use it the way the adventure says to use it. How do we do that? We go to edit and we click duplicate. And then we close out of this. All right, we go over to our journal tab and we scroll all the way to the bottom because that's where copied things end up and we go to copy a skeleton we're gonna edit it and we're gonna call this a skeletal hoplite and yeah I think that's how you spell it all right we're gonna remove the art and we're gonna remove the token and then I'm going to go and grab my skeletal hoplite uh, miniature because I have such a thing. I actually have three different ones because I have a problem, uh, I guess. Uh, so let me drag this over. Here we go. Sweet. Looks pretty cool. Uh, all right. And then we will save it. Then we'll go to the character sheet. Uh, we're going to edit the sheet directly. And we have to turn this guy into a skeletal hoplite. What does that mean? Well, uh, for starters, we know that they are wearing very expensive armor. Uh, again, if you haven't figured it out in this campaign, your players are going to be rich. Like crazy rich. I mean, honestly, one of them, if they took Demigod, is the prince of an entire city and his dad is a god and he lives in a palace. So if you thought that, that money was going to be an issue in this campaign, have I got news uh, for you. All right, here we go. Uh, this is Skeletal Hoplite uh, and he has a breastplate and a shield. All right, uh, so that changes the armor class to an 18 instead of a 13 and makes these guys incredibly valuable, especially if they have a means to transport all these breastplates back home. Now, it also says that they have the techniques of a soldier. Well, I think they're referring to the hoplite soldiers that were already battled earlier in the um, campaign, like outside the Oracle. So I'm going to look that up. Uh, let's see, Hoplite Soldier. Nope. So we'll just actually go to the Soldier character sheet from earlier. There we go. I'm going to use the search at the top. All right, there we go, Soldier. If you wanted to spice this up a little, I guess you could reskin the um, Soldier Captain as well and have some of the skeletons be beefier and stronger than the others. But what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to make sure that whatever these guys can do, uh, the skeletons can do. So I'm going to give them martial advantage. There we go. I mean, because it has the same tactics as the other guys, so that's my understanding of it. Uh, let's see. And then they have this long spear. Um, which isn't that great to just make up a weapon and then your players end up with it. So we're actually just going to call this uh, a spear. And what was suggested to me was that instead of dropping reach 10 single-handed um, spears uh, into your campaign, is these guys are just trained in a technique that allows them to fight a 10-foot range uh, without actually being it. So basically, they're like spear masters or something. All right, so we changed that out from a short sword to a spear. So that matches a little bit better. And then we'll give them a javelin instead of a bow to match up with the hoplite uh, thing a bit more. It may have been easier just to turn a soldier into a skeleton at this point, but we're already, we've already come this far. So let's just keep going. So 30, 90. Um, everything else could stay the same. And then finally we have to add a new attack, this shield push. All right. And you could bet if I'm having to build this now, I'm going to throw a bunch of skeletal hoplites in later on um, as like yard trash in another area. 
because if I had to go ahead and do this, I might as well, you know, benefit from it. All right, reaches uh, five feet. Uh, let's see, going off of its other stuff, uh, it's got a plus four to its attack rolls. And then on a hit, the shield only does a D2. Uh, and then plus one, sure. Um, there's some inconsistencies here because uh, we're using like um, the dexterity for the skeleton on all of its attacks, which I guess is cheating, but I don't really care because uh, I'm the DM and I want it to be challenging and my guys are going to die anyways in the same Pathfinder and you can't call the Pathfinder Society police on me, so there you go. Uh, and this does bludgeoning damage. Alright. Cool. So now, we have some skeletal hoplites, uh, as we were instructed to do. So, let's go ahead and register their miniature real quick. Alright, drag this over. Double click on it, set it up real quick. Um. I like to use uh, red for my hit points instead of green. So I'm going to set that up there. NPC AC right here. And they can see uh, in the dark. Cool. All right. And then I'm going to, while it's selected, go to edit skeletal hoplite, register the token. And now I can drag out as many of these guys as I need. Uh, to fill this room, which is technically six. So we've got one already, and we'll drag another. And then I could also just copy and paste more in. Boom. All right, that room's done, and we fixed the skeleton problem. So we progress further into the dungeon. We keep going left, follow the winding trail, and we make it to room 23. All right. So we walk into room 23, and let's see, this rectangular room, uh, already an issue, right? Because it's square, it's not rectangular, so something's going on here. Uh, this rectangular room has a high ceiling, uh, sculpted walls, and a flagstone floor. A mangled skeleton lies near the entryway. Okay, there's a clue. The walls are embellished with rows of screaming stone faces. Okay. The far end of the room features a heavy pair of a pair of heavy bronze double doors. Two skeletons are sprawled on the floor in front of the doors. Their bones are partially crushed and their armor is mangled. So they have given you some clues about what's going on in this room. Also, whenever I hear that a door is like a double door, I assume that it takes up like 10 feet. I mean, a double door that's only 5 feet? I feel like I'm opening a wardrobe to Narnia, you know? Like, why make it a double door and not make it 10 feet wide? I have no idea. All right, so what can we do to fix this room? All right, let's bring out, uh, let's see, we'll bring out Phil. Phil will be our test dummy. No, wait, Phil can't see in the dark. So let's bring out Reset. There we go. All right. There we go. Uh, so Reset's here. We'll move her to the token layer. And we'll jump into her miniature so we can see. Oh, yeah, right. She can't see in the dark either. All right. So let's just assume she has a torch. There we go. Uh, all right. So Reset is in the room and she's looking around and she's like, I don't know, guys. I think there might be a trap. I just got a weird suspicion. Oh, is it the blood on the floor or the description of the skeletons that they didn't bother to draw? Like what? what's giving you a... The idea that there might be a trap. Well, I don't know. It's just because I can see the trap because it's right there because they drew it on the map. Oh, wow. Yeah. Mm. Mm. I guess you're right. I guess you can see that. So what we could try to do to fix this is we could go to dynamic lighting layer and we could, I mean, the best, the best we could really do here without redrawing the, this whole room in Photoshop is we could take a dynamic lighting tool and we could hide um, essentially this part of the room now is it it already reeks of like trap and this is definitely going to further 
uh, rouse their suspicions. But hey, at least the room's a rectangle now. Uh, so they're going to be like, why is this the first wall that we haven't been able to see like the whole wall for? And there's blood on the ground and all that. Honestly, the amount of clues that they have in the description, they should know this is a trap. They're going to start looking for for traps and stuff like that. But at least you save yourself the embarrassment of the trap actually being on the map. And all you had to do was just draw one line um, in the dynamic lighting layer. So I guess we'll say that this room is fixed. All right. That brings us to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, throw a try. Uh, location 24, Tomb of Xander. Hmm. So here we are in Xander's tomb. Uh, Reset walks in, looks around. Cool. Now there is a sconce on the wall, and it does look like it's lit according to the illustration. But let's see what it says here. A large barrel vaulted chamber is decorated with polished bronze fittings which flicker like gold in the dim red light of a single torch. Okay. So, uh, I talked about this in my video where I kind of went over this whole module, but they sold you a bunch of dynamically lit maps without finishing the dynamic lighting like so congratulations you spent 50 dollars on an incomplete product uh if there is light in the dungeon and it's described in the adventure as there being light in a room and i paid you to dynamically light the damn map for me the least you could do map making people of the world is to put the goddamn torch in the room for me. So, uh, we're going to do that ourselves. Now, of course, we have our own uh, fire and torches and all that jazz that we've made ourselves because we're World 20 champs and we watched the informational video series available on YouTube that taught us how to do all this stuff. So I'm going to go down and I'm going to take this fire 4020 and I'm going to drop it here. And put it on the torch and now this room is actually lit by a torch Whew, man that was rough it was rough uh glad i was able to do that and they they uh didn't spend the 30 seconds it would have taken to put that torch in there uh all right so room 24 uh we're in xander's tomb now if they've been attacked by a previous tomb they will of course stab xander's tomb and that's fine. Uh, so the torch is an ever-burning torch. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, you got to have a combined strength to open it. Uh, and then it says, as soon as the sarcophagus is open, if Graxus is still alive, he just arrives to attack the heroes. How does he arrive to attack the heroes? You know the answer. Magic. Um, don't, don't, don't explain yourself. Don't explain yourself. He's just there. He's just there. So, oh, look, the adventure knew he was going to be there. So he's off to the side here. Here's Graxus. Now, personally, I'm going to have Graxus hunting them down constantly during the whole adventure. So I doubt Graxus is still going to be alive at this point, but who knows? Uh, what do we got going on with Graxus? Uh, let's check his character sheet. All right. He's a Minotaur. He can make a two attacks. He can charge. He's got Labyrinthian Recall, which is how he got there so fast. Wink. And then he can also go Reckless. He's only got 94 hit points. I say only. They're going to be like level 4, I think, when they get here. And there's 6 of them. So this guy is going to get smoked hard. Like, he's just he's just going to get messed up. There's also a lot of things going on with Graxus that are, um, that are terrible. Uh, first and foremost, like, I mean, I don't like the art. But that's neither here nor there. Uh, secondly, look at how big he is. And look at how big the map is. Oh. Hmm. Okay. That's uh, unfortunate. Yeah. What do we <laughs> What do we got going on here? Um, hmm. Right? He's too big. So if he's too big, what does that mean? Uh, that means that this poor uh, Minotaur quote unquote boss monster is going to be squeezing all the time. And squeezing is such a rare status condition that they doesn't even show up as its own entry when you search for it. But essentially, 
um, squeezing. Let me see if I can find it. Here we go. What the hell is squeezing? A creature can squeeze through a space that is large enough for a creature one size smaller than this. Thus, a large creature can squeeze through a passage that's only five feet wide. Get ready for it. While squeezing through a space, a creature must spend one extra foot for every foot that it moves. So difficult terrain. And it has disadvantage on attack rolls and dexterity saving throws. And attack rolls against the creature have advantage while it's in the smaller space. Huh. Okay. So... <laughs> So somehow this guy who moves half speed through the, through this entire dungeon is going to magically show up just in time uh, to confront the characters as they try to open this tomb, even though he's too fucking big for the dungeon they put him in. Um, I have run into this before. Uh, I myself uh, had a bunch of like frost giants like in a dungeon that was too small for them and they had to squeeze the whole time and it was miserable it was a miserable experience uh the players had a great time uh the frost giants and i had a terrible time and i felt like a, a big idiot and i kind of was and um yeah i don't know how this decision could have been made honestly um even if he was crazy strong which he's not he's only a cr5 like yeah i just don't know because like his hit points right are kind of low for a quote-unquote boss he doesn't have a ranged attack right so like he's gonna be moving 20 feet at a time through these passages he's gonna be squeezing the whole time <sighs> i don't know i don't know it like hurts my brain uh so if uh let's say let's just move him to the object layer I'm going to just mess this whole map up because why not? Uh, so Reset's here and she sees him coming and like it's awkward, right? Because he's always kind of smushed like because he's snapping to grid. If you didn't want him to snap to grid, you could make him a drawing. But if he was a drawing, then you wouldn't be able to access his hit points or anything. So that's a pain in the butt. Now, you could, every time you move him, hold down Alt, and that would allow you um, to place him without snapping to grid, and that's kind of cool. And he's kind of big, so that's that's definitely intimidating. But, like, what are we supposed to do about him being, like, you know, like, squeezing the whole time? That's terrible. Uh, so, in the Odyssey group I'm in, this question comes up all the time. Like, how how are we supposed to deal with this nonsense? right? Like, it doesn't make any sense. How are we supposed to deal with it? So this morning, I kind of decided, because um, I played a lot of, like, Assassin's Creed Odyssey to get into, I guess, uh, bastardized Greek mythology, um, you know, historical fiction kind of thing. And I was like, uh, there's a part where Cassandra gets to go to the Olympics and compete. Um, and, like, this guy is, like, really into oil. And, like, everybody's into oil. They're into oil in each other down getting that olive oil going, putting the special sense in the olive oil. And I was like, hmm, hmm. If I was a really big dude and I was on an all-meat diet, and this is the stuff I think about because I DM too much, and I lived in a labyrinth that was too small for me, what would I do with all, like, the extra fatty bits from the people and the animals I was eating? I would boil it down into some sweet-ass lard, and I would lube myself up all the time so that I could get around the dungeon easier. So I was like, let's just make this guy oily, right? Uh, I think there's like a Street Fighter character that's like all about oil or whatever. So I'm going to add this ability to him called Oil Down. And essentially, since he's oiled down, um, let's see, let me copy it, the correct stuff, and paste it in. There we go. Yeah, Graxus can squeeze without penalty. Further, he has advantage to any saving throws or skill checks made to escape or avoid a grapple and may disengage as a bonus action. However, he has disadvantage against spells and effects with fire and attacks that deal fire are made with advantage against him. That was a much better compromise to giving him vulnerability to fire. Okay, yeah, I see in chat, somebody says double everything. Okay, so I will show you real fast how easy it is to double everything. But then we will talk about why aesthetically it just doesn't work. Um, so I'm going to go over to the settings for Tomb of Xander. 
I'm going to go to page settings. Now, without any effort whatsoever, I could just double the map. And all I have to do is go to the page scaling and where it says one grid equals five feet. Cool, cool, cool. No problem. What about cell width? So I'm going to say that a cell, which would be a grid, which would be a square, whatever, is 35 pixels instead of 70. And I'm going to hit OK. All right. And then I'm going to go ahead and mess with this grid real quick so that you could see that we've now made it 10 feet. All right. Cool. Cool. Right. This dungeon is freaking huge now. And all the double doors are double doors. And that's cool and all. And Graxus can be a large creature. Uh, and that's cool. Uh, let's make him not a drawing anymore. There we go. And Reset could be a little lady. All right. And this is way more intimidating. And allies can stand side by side as they fight. And skeletons can do. And now the walls are 10 feet wide. So it's a little bit harder to exploit the walls. It feels like a really good solution. Like it solved a lot of problems. Uh, but then you do end up into aesthetic issues where, like, I could fix this easily with Photoshop. You go in here and you'd shrink down this tomb so that, you know, like, why would they bury Xander in a 30 or 30 foot long sarcophagus? I mean, he was a cool dude, but he wasn't, was he cool enough for a, a 30 foot long sarcophagus? Uh, so there are some things that do get a little, a little funky with that, like, did he kill like an ogre or a troll here with the skeleton uh, up here at the front? Eh, you know, maybe we could make this work. Yeah. That would actually be kind of cool. I don't, eh, I mean, there's another huge sarcophagus here. So really, we're only looking at like two problems aesthetically. I mean, this axe is completely ridiculous, but, um, hmm, yeah. I guess that is a solution. So if you want to go with a bigger dungeon, I'll show you again how you do that on Xander's Tomb. You just go over to your settings and you go to uh, page scale and you change the cell width uh, to 35 pixels uh, instead of 70, which will make it 0.5. Uh, that should translate over to the measurement tool as well. So let me double check that to show you. So we go to our measurement tool and reset is one, two, three, four, five, six. So she's 30 feet away, uh, 30 feet. Yeah, so everything adjusts accordingly. So <clears throat> if you do wanna go that route uh, and make this tomb extra super big, uh, you can. Uh, just keep in mind that you're going to have a couple of really weird aesthetic things that happen, like a ginormous Minotaur axe, a, um extra-large uh, tomb here, and another extra-large thing there. Now, we could go into our map layer, and we could fix that just by dropping some rando assets in here. So, let's see. Uh, let's do tile. And what do we got here for tiles? Eh, keep going. Mm -hmm. We'll go to the free section so everybody could play play at home. All right, so here's some tiles. Put it down. Okay. And then we'll put another one there. Cool. Uh, and then I guess we could just go and grab a sarcophagus. I don't even know how to spell that. Uh, sar. Nope. We're in the wrong one. Here we go. Sar. Cough. Spelling's really hard. And let's see. I mean, I have some sarcophagi from like some asset packs i've bought it's tempting to just like call it a day Ooh, look at how nice that one is yeah i'll just do that so you guys are on your own find your own sarcophagus all right and then put it like that eh, 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 eh. okay and we'll make it slightly more human sized it's still pretty big but 
I guess he's, you know, he's a pretty important guy. And then we'll put it right in the middle of the room. Bam. And then to keep the illusion going, uh, we could go back over to this room and put the exact same sarcophagus down. And honestly, we could put it like that and say that the thing below it is like a raised dais. Damn. All right. Elegant solution for sure. All right. Uh, if we really wanted to hide this axe, uh, we could just fill the room up with bones. So I could do that real quick. Uh, there we go. We got some bone piles. So we'll just drop some bones in there. Bones. Bones. More bones. All right, what layer do you guys think you're on? Map layer? Okay. Why are you all like semi-transparent then? Oh, you're just really dirty. Okay. Uh, let's see. All right, then we go back to the object layer. All right, cool. So, wow. Uh, thanks for the suggestion, Raz25. Uh, doubling up the map and then covering up a couple of assets sort of just solved the Graxus problem. I still kind of want him to be greasy, though. <laughs> so I think I'll just keep him greasy anyways. Um, yeah. All right. Sweet. So then back in this room, yeah, we're still hiding that. No problem. No problem. All right, so together, as a community, we came together and we solved the Graxus uh, and the scaling problem once and for all. Everyone, congratulate yourselves, your heroes. Uh, good stuff. Uh, we do have ginormous skeletons here, so we need to go back and resize those real quick. All right. And of course, uh, we've got ginormous. Well, actually, we could make it ginormous now if we wanted to. Eh, eh, eh. <laughs> Sweet. All right. Um, yeah. Let's just leave them both huge. That'll be cool. All right. Um, so they talk to Xander and they take care of Xander business. Uh, they get the armaments of the dragon Lord. They talk to the vanished one, the treasure. And I guess that's the dungeon. Yeah. Um, it also allows the skeletons to act like hoplites. Cause they'll be able to form up like shield wall formations and stuff like that. Yeah. Well done. I think the only thing that we need now, if you've got 10 foot labyrinth, is we should probably add a gelatinous cube. You know what I'm saying? Just, you know, for general maintenance and stuff like that. I feel like if we've got two, like, got a mimic in there already, let's give our boy gelatinous cube some love. So let's throw a gelatinous cube in there. There we go. I feel like we'd be letting down expectations if we didn't have a gelatinous cube or two. Um, that we're kind of moving around in this dungeon. This also makes it easier for your Minotaur skeletons. So uh, the Minotaur skeletons can now move around the dungeon without grinding their bones against the hallways the whole time. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so we get rid of these crapo ones and then we go and we grab a skeleton and we drop these Minotaur skeletons in. Now Minotaur skeletons are a lot of fun. Um, they feature prominently in a lot of stuff in F Tomb of Annihilation. Uh, they've got a gore attack, they got a great axe attack, they got charge. They're pretty fun. But there is another type of undead Minotaur that's even more fun than that. And that's what I plan to use. Um, so in the creature compendium is something called a lost Minotaur. And a lost Minotaur is a nasty monster. Look at that cutie. Oh, man. Right? Uh, and these guys are significantly tougher. So what you might want to do... 
um, is take a look at the stats for Lost Minotaur and maybe mash it on top of uh, Graxus to give him a little bit more to work with. Because here he's got a Gore Attack, he's got the Twilight Great Axe, which just sounds awesome. Um, and it does like necrotic damage. I know that he's using a shield or whatever, but we could definitely adapt some pretty cool stuff from here. Uh, some magic resistance, because dude's so overly cursed that you know he can't he can't take it anymore. Uh, but yeah, visually at least, I think this definitely looks more fun than the Minotaur skeleton. Um, which why did it drag out a Minotaur skeleton with no picture? Let me see. Uh, Minotaur Skeleton. Give me one with a picture. Hmm. Okay, I think I have to delete the other one before I can drag out the new one. Let me do that real quick. Ah, uh, yeah. There it is. So, get out of here, you monstrosity. There we go. And we'll drag over the other Minotaur Skeleton. There we go. I mean, as far as, like, standard art goes, that's a pretty cool-looking Minotaur Skeleton. All right, so we got those guys in there. Cool. Still, though, I like the Minotaur Lost one, so that's totally what I'm going to use for um, the artwork, at least. I even made uh, my own miniature for it uh, by copying the art out of the Creature Codex. Yeah, right? I mean, this one's pretty cool, but I feel like this is like a bit more creepy and menacing. So, um, But yeah... Uh, I think that's all the locations, and I think that with a couple of fixes in Roll20 via um, pulling in our own assets to cover up the oversized assets and changing the scaling and hiding this trap and adding the one torch they couldn't be bothered to add, I think we just fixed it. I think we fixed Xander's Tomb. This actually makes me happy and sad because I really wanted to use a different map. Uh, so, like, look at this thing. Like, this is a cool map. Like, holy crap, is this a cool map. But, um, the more I looked at this map, the more I was like, it would be very hard to explain, like, why this was Xander's Tomb. Um, and I'm, like, pretty good at bullshitting, but I couldn't figure out a good way to make this sound like, uh, it could be Xander's Tomb. So I think with the fixes that we've done, I'm just going to use the fixed one and I'm going to save this map and I think it will make a good island side quest because eventually they get magic ship and they get to travel to magic islands. I think this would be an awesome side dungeon uh, to sort of go and get some extra loots and extra ass kicking um, while they're exploring different islands. Maybe like a cult of um, Baphomet or something. Uh, with a bunch of like super demonic uh, Minotaurs that have gone all in for like the demon lord of beasts sort of thing and the terrorizing the region and uh, yeah stuff like that would be kind of cool. So I will have to sadly save this absolutely gorgeous labyrinth map and they can have two labyrinths because who doesn't want that and I'll just go ahead and use the Tomb of Xander that we fixed together. Uh, I will go in, of course, and turn off these hellaciously pink lines. There we go. Turn the opacity down. Maybe make this like a dark gray so they could still see. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that works good. And now the double doors actually have a reason for being double doors. Ah, this fixes everything. So there we go, guys. Uh, less than an hour, we managed to turn this map around and swap out broken assets and uh, make big decisions that suddenly made the whole dungeon make a hell of a lot more sense. So um, I'm going to go ahead and post the VOD of this up on YouTube so we can share it with everybody else in the dragon lords uh gms community and uh share it out with anybody that you think would benefit from it and i'll catch you guys uh, next time <laughs>